Hello and welcome to the British basketball scene, your home for news and interviews inside the BBL. Now, thank you for joining me here on this interview, the first ever on this channel and the first of many to feature here on the British basketball scene. I could not have asked for any better of a first guest. Uh, today, I will be featuring the uh, great story and basketball career of Bristol Flyers big man, Daniel Adozi. So I'm joined by Daniel Adozi, the Bristol Flyers big man who has been around in the BBL for five years. He has been one of the more dominant players in the league. Daniel, thank you so much for joining me. No, no worries. Thank you so much for having me. So, how have you been uh, coping in the in the quarantine life so far? Uh, the quarantine life hasn't been that bad, to be honest with you. Um, let's see. We got through in March, and ever since then, it's just been like trying to lock in and finish um, finish some of the stuff that I'm doing in terms of like my schoolwork or trying to start a new project or taking on something new like reading, um, writing. Uh, also, too, just trying to like find ways to build things for the future. So it's been more like creativity, more, taking the time out to spend time on things that you can put your mind and ideas towards, or spend some time towards those sort of things. So yeah, but well, that's all good. Yeah, I mean, you got to try and survive as much as you can at the moment, and try and make the most of of opportunities that you can at home. So uh, I, I think it's fair to say that you're obviously uh, missing basketball quite a lot at the moment. Uh, I mean, I know I am. So uh, f for you to be a professional player, in it, you must be itching to get back on the court. Oh man, good question. Well, kind of, sort of. Um, you know, it's kind of like okay, right now, not playing basketball, but equally at the same time too, like life after life after sport. Is also important as well. Um, so it's also important to invest a little bit of time towards that. But in terms of like right now in the career wise, or right now in this time, kind of it's like it's more like fifty fifty. I'm not not too bothered to not be on the court, but I'm not bothered to be off the court because I'm keeping myself um, engaged and stuff like that. And just put my also spending time educating myself in terms of like everything that's going on. Yeah, definitely. It, it does really uh, benefit to to try and educate yourself and try and you know read up on everything that you can whilst you you know you've got the you know the free time anyways. So I, I kind of want to touch on you because doing my research for this, this this interview, I have come across a, you know a really impactful story that you, that you have uh, growing up. So you, you were born in in London, right? So how, how was it growing up uh, before? Obviously, because you moved to the US. Uh, right. What was it like growing up in, in in England before the move? So I was just, it was just me and my mom. And uh, growing up as a child, we went through a series of different, different circumstances. One moment was living here. Next moment was living there. Next moment was living with some family. Next moment we had moved somewhere to like, we were moved to America for some time, then coming back and then moving to America and coming back. And so a lot of it was uh, the lack of stability. And most times when we were moving around, it's because either one, uh, we was moved by a council estate, like uh, the, the council had moved us for some reason, or two, I, I was going to a new school, uh, but that school was at such a, such a distance that we had to move a bit more closer to where it works for uh, my situation. Um, that was one. And then another, t another thing, too, is that my mom and I, we oftentimes struggled a lot in terms of, uh, like, basic like things in terms of, like, food or, um, you know what I mean, like, having those sort of, like, luxuries that any kid would, would dream of having. I wouldn't say we always struggled a lot, all the time, but I can remember periods of times when we didn't have enough and we had to kind of, oh, my mom had to do whatever she could, I guess, to try and go get whatever it is that we both need it or some days we just go without it so um I, I remember like you know certain hardships that we experienced I remember one time we had uh we had we had got oh, what was it what was it actually i'm trying to remember there's quite a few things uh we had went to america 
and um, we had went to America. And when we came back, we were in this position where we had to go out and try and find everything again for ourselves and trying trying to figure out like who can we go to, um, who can we live with. And you know, we, we came back and then the first thing we all automatically did was go to the Croydon Council. Uh, and what they did was basically put us in a hotel for a few weeks and then we moved around a few times. And then we ended up coming, um, we ended up getting, having some support from our family. And we ended up staying in a flat in Norbury for not too long. Well, well in fact, we stayed in a flat in Norbury. And then we had uh, stayed there for a period of time. So before going, coming back to America, so it was a lot of like moving around and trying to figure out where on earth was we were going to stay at, where was we going to settle for a little while. And, and you mentioned, you know, trying to, trying to find somewhere to, to stay and stuff. Uh, I also uncovered that you had a three day like sort of journey from from Boston to to Las Vegas. So sort of tell me how that sort of went about and like what you were feeling at the time of moving uh, the, the you know that distance. So this is our third time when we moved to America uh, in two thousand and four, and we were staying in Boston for a few days, well, like two days or so, and then we ended up taking this random three day bus trip to Las Vegas. And during that time, it was just kind of like uh, trying to figure out, like, why are we moving here? Where are we going? What are we doing? You know, who are we going to go see or who are we visiting? And uh, because, unfortunately, we have family members in three different places, one in Texas, one in Florida, or some in Texas, Florida, and New York. And we didn't go to any of those places. And for the reasons why, I I still don't know now to this day. So... Uh, but I just know we took this three-day, three, random three-day bus trip, and it was just like, okay, it's it's like going through the unknown. Like you don't know exactly where you're going, you know, you don't exactly know what that what what direction life is planning to put you on, or what what bus life is planning to put you on, and so you're just kind of going with the flow and just going with the going with what you see in the moment, and just not trying to uh, be reactive to how you feel, just kind of. You know, just just see where this journey takes you. I was only 12 years old at the time as well, so I didn't really have much of a say in anything that went. I'm just kind of going along with it. I guess, you know, with with all the moves and stuff, you kind of also have a lot of life lessons to learn from an early age, sort of becoming a, an adult from an early age. And that kind of can help you progress, you know, and, and mature, you know, kind of earlier than, than all the other kids around you as well. Oh, 100%, 100%. Because sometimes when you're facing these life experiences at such a young age, it kind of forces you, no, it kind of, it actually forces you to grow up much more faster. And uh, sometimes there's this point where some people who are challenged to grow up faster is either one, you know, they'll they'll rise above the occasion or two, they'll fall short of the actual purpose, fall short of the actual outcome. And when we're talking about um, growing up real fast, it's like you, you, you come to this, this, this space of maturity and you understand that life for you is a bit different. And I'm not saying it trying to compare it to anybody else, but you become a bit more aware of what's going on outside of you and what's going on within you. And you kind of have, you start to develop and you start to connect the dots and you start to put things together in a way that actually forces you to think a bit more um, emotionally uh, mature about your situation and stuff like that. I mean, and it's quite unfortunate because sometimes there's kids that do grow, that do go through life experiences that, but they don't mature or they don't grow to understand. And then unfortunately they, they'll somehow get trapped in the emotion of the experience and they're not able to recover from that. So, you know, trying to grow up is a challenge for them and trying to, trying to, trying to help them to see that this this thing or these story, these things that are happening to you or happening outside of you isn't exactly who you are. They're only testing you. They're only trying to help you to grow and to become a bit more of a better version of you. Yeah, I, I, yeah the, the, a lot of life lessons can be learned from just trial and error and trying to, you know, jumping at the deep end as, as well. Uh, how, how did you juggle going to, uh, obviously you went to Hollenbeck uh, Middle School. How did you try and juggle going to school as well as also trying to find somewhere to, to kind of stay and, and rest your head in between. So Hollenbeck was, um, 
was in California, uh, Los Angeles, and we were staying at a shelter. We're staying at a shelter not too far away from where the the middle school is. In fact, it's probably like a 15, 20 minute bus ride. But the thing was uh, juggling between situation in school and situation outside of school, you know, it, it's kind of like, you just, you, you put, you're, you're caught in between, you're caught in a crossfire of a situation that you didn't ask for in the first place. You know what I mean? Like you're expected to go to school and learn, but then outside of school, the support structure and everything outside of that doesn't support you to do well in school. I mean, that it comes down to you and your determination to try to, to try to uh, be a, be a good student in school, whatever the case is. So um, and it wasn't just that school. In fact, it was times where even in Las Vegas, like we, I was going to school and, uh, <laughs> and it was times where I would go to school. I would come out, come out of school, meet up with my mom. But then the next thing we're doing is we're taking like five, six bags. And I'm not talking about like, you know, small bags. I'm talking about like luggage, suitcases and stuff. And we're going on the, we're getting on the bus and we're traveling somewhere, you know, outskirts of Las Vegas to try and find some shelter. And unfortunately, a couple of shelters, uh, well, one shelter didn't allow us to come in because we can't come in. Well, we've we've overstayed we've overstayed our time in the shelter, so you can only you can't come back for another like two months or something like that. And then um, the other one uh, that we used to stay at was overfilled, so. You know, we can. There was no space, and there was no. Um, there's, they wasn't taking anybody else in, so we just kind of like went on a search for ourselves. And yeah, so we went on. The, we went on this bus for some time. Went to this place. Couldn't find her. Uh, couldn't find the time. Uh, couldn't find the person that was looking for. And then you know, we get we got kicked off of a off of a off of a certain place or out of a certain apartment complex because. We was either soliciting or trespassing, but we was, we was only looking for somebody. And police officers uh, came to the scene of where he was, and they told us we have to leave, leave otherwise they're going to send us to jail, whatever the case is, which was kind of like, wait a minute, you know, hold on. But we had to leave anyway, so we left. And then um, we walked back the journey, of, like whatever the distance was from wherever we took the bus from in like downtown Las Vegas to the outskirts of Vegas, we ended up like walking some of that back and it was quite it's quite a distance don't get me wrong so um and there was some nights where like within that journey like i ended up having to go to school during that time so it's kind of like you know I, walking all night to then sleeping in the park and then you know mom gives me some bus tokens and then go to school and <laughs> think everything is okay like it's really not but you're, you're still like just in a space where you know, it's just there's just that emotional maturity. Like nobody really knows what's going on outside of school, but at the same time, you're so humbled. So, yeah, it's kind of like really trying to juggle the two was was an emotional task. Yeah, definitely. I mean, anyone listening to this story can can try and get motivated and see that you can. I mean, looking at your career, you can get over these humps, and you know, the 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 down troubles of of life can can then blossom into something greater and and try and you know, try and make you a better person in that. Um, obviously, I mean, I, for some people not uh, that are watching may not know that uh, you were separated from from your mother in, in this time as well. Um, what were what were your thoughts go? You know, when when this happened? <laughs> now you take me back in the time. So yeah. I remember when I was uh, I was I was basically I just came from a shelter that was serving food at the time, and. Uh, my mom, like me and my mom, put like this. So me and my mom, we were walking down the street in, in Skid Row, Los Angeles, downtown. If, if you don't know what Skid Row is, um, Skid Row is basically like a two to three mile radius in downtown Los Angeles, California, that is just filled with absolute like poverty and impoverished people. And so, um, and so uh, we was walking through this, you know, part of, part of Skid Row, and I asked my mom, well, we walked past the shelter that was serving food. I asked my mom, mom, can we go in and get some food? And she said no, and she kept walking. And so I came to this point where, you know what, let me stop and let me actually just think 
I don't know what made me do this, but I just came to this point where I just stopped and I asked myself the question, do I want to continuously keep, do I want to keep going down this path, you know, and everything that's been going, that's, that's went down with coming, uh, that has came with going down this path, or do I go into the shelter and get some food to eat? So I, I instead uh, go into the shelter, get some food to eat. Mom doesn't come back and uh, go and get some food to eat. And I come out, this is the only thing that I have. And I promise you, I'm not making this up. Only thing I had was 150 to 200 gallon trash bag filled with clothes. You know, no money, no phone, no bus pass, no sort of resource, like nothing, right? And um, it's almost like, you know, being at rock bottom at the age of 12. You know, it's like, what more, what more worse can happen? And so, uh, so I, I made a right. Uh, I remember making a right and then I made a left down the main street. And when I got to the corner of that main street, what I saw next is that my mom was on the bus heading to where she wanted to go to. And um, I, I'm standing on the corner and I'm looking up and I'm like, okay, you know, 12 years old, having to, having to, having to soak this one in, you know, it's, it's like, geez, all right. So I look to my left and I see that uh, there's a bus stop and I'm thinking, okay, maybe my mom's gonna get off the bus or run to the bus, you know, just what's gonna happen. But in fact, here's what happens. So the bus gets to the bus stop, you know, I'm waiting there on the corner. I see no sign of my mom, and then the bus keeps on going. So now I'm 12 years old, and the heart of Skid Row, which is one of the toughest places in the United States of America in terms of poverty, in terms of even, like, in terms of even just trying to find hope to get out of here, you know, we're talking about finding the necessary will to get up and move, like, you know, with the environment that I'm in and, with people who are, uh, are who are on substances that don't promote any sort of positive health or well-being sort of thing. And um, I remember looking and it was like, you know, a decision had to be made. It's either I become a part of this environment or become a product of it, or I either, you know, use everything in my toolbox and I, I use my moral compass and just find what it is that I'm looking for. And uh, I end up like looking for looking for just some shelter for that night, and coming to find out, I I got picked up. Well, yeah, I got, I came across three different shelters, but the third one, I'm just gonna narrow it down here. Uh, but the third shelter, uh, I asked them for some help. They weren't able to give it to me because I was under the age of 18, and so they called the police. Police came and picked me up. Went on the search for my mom, couldn't find her, and then. Um, and then I uh, ended up at the police station later on that evening and then ended up getting picked up by a social worker. So a social worker comes pick me, picks me up and tells me I'm in the foster care system. And, and then from there, it's like life just took a 180. So, yeah. So after you obviously had, uh, had gone through this system and uh, you moved to uh, Centennial High School in, in, in Compton. So what did this sort of motivate you to start your basketball journey you know you, you were quite a the you were quite the builder in, in your class so did did that start your basketball journey in in high school uh no actually it came before that so i was in um i was starting the well i was starting school now that i have structure and i just got into the foster care system and in my second home in compton california and um it was it was just kind of like so I started playing American football at first. I was playing American football, and then um, you know after the season was done, I uh, started playing uh, a little bit of middle. I started. Well, I went to the middle school that I was in. They had a basketball team there, and I had a my coach, not my coach, my one of my my PE teacher. That's who it was. PE teacher was like, "Oh, you should play basketball." And then like, I know this coach A, B, and C. Um, who who could get you a good opportunity to play for a basketball team? Or well, have you ever thought about playing basketball? And I said, no, I have not. And, um, yeah, after that, I started playing AU basketball. And AU basketball was one of those ones where, you know, you know how the system is and stuff like that. It's like the first game, first game at age 13, 13 or 14, something like that. And, um, and what happened was uh, – I play. I was playing in a basketball tournament, and then uh, that's my first game. And then after that, I remember walking away from the game, and I was like, "Man, I, I hate this game, but also love it at the same time." In fact, I was playing with my middle school. I was playing with my middle school team, and most of the most of the kids that were that were on that team were also on my AU team. So, um, but yeah. So 
I'm oh, sorry, most of the kids that were in the AAU team were on my middle school basketball team. And so this was the first time I essentially played with them. But so so then what happens is I I walked away from that first game and I was like, all right, you know, I can't wait to play the next game sort of thing. And um, after that, I just kind of like started playing, I started playing sport and I started like enjoying this, enjoying the competitive segment. Um, you know, I, was, I enjoyed the fact that I was a bit, I was challenged more physically than ever as opposed to mentally. Uh, it also like kept me out, like kept me away from home as well, kept me away from the foster, <laughs> from the foster house. So it's a good way to like keep me out and keep me doing something. And then um, after that, I started playing like eighth grade, ninth grade. In fact, I got injured. I got injured one one year, 20, I think it was 20, 2008 or nine. I ended up breaking my tibia bone and I set up for a year. And uh, the mental comeback from that was, was, was good. And the physical comeback was good. But I set out my first year in high school and I didn't actually start playing basketball again until uh, till my sophomore year, which is... 14, 15, and from there, I just, it just became a part of my, well, part of my, I use it as a vehicle, and I still use it as a vehicle today. Absolutely, and, and you have become one of the, the more dominant players in in British basketball, uh, as we know it so far, so uh, you did, after going to, going to high school, you do make the jump to NGCAA with uh, Ty, uh, Tyler Jun- uh, Junior College, so how, what was it like playing, you know, was it a step up from fr- from that high school level? Yeah, yeah, it definitely was. You know, anytime you play collegiate level, um, collegiate level, it definitely gets better. The, the competition gets a bit more intense. And so um, it was quite interesting because at that time, like my first year of junior college was just kind of like, okay, I was away from California. I'm in Texas. Uh, never been here, not not in this specific area. And so, um, and so like, it's, it's, it feels good to be in a new environment, a completely new environment. But then it's like, you know, getting the chance to like meet different people. Um, never been in this space where like, okay, you know, it's a completely different world sort of thing. Uh, way different from high school. Like, you know, you know, now more the responsibilities on you as opposed to, uh, as opposed to like you just come to school and then you you're staying on the school campus all day long, you know. Where it's like now you you know you have you have, you come to school or you have you have like school like uh, class at like eleven, come back to the, your dorm, you have class at one, then you have like practice at like two or three, some some something along those lines, and then um, and then yeah, you go back, you go eat, whatever the case is, so. It was uh it was quite a, it was good in, it was a good like um, uh, opportunity for like taking responsibility and also like like the intensity of training on court. But then it wasn't until I went to Iowa State and to and then it took a completely different level like that took another jump. So you know. uh, as you mentioned, the you're going to Iowa State and playing in the in, in playing D one basketball in the NCAA division. Um, so how, how again you, you mentioned the, the big jump? How, how come you chose Iowa State? What, what was the process in going to to move into Iowa State? Uh, so originally, I was I was actually committed verbally committed to Minnesota, uh, Minnesota Gophers, and um, you know the, unfortunately the thing the, the 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 offer didn't go through as planned. So then. And and before I uh, verbally committed with Minnesota, Iowa State was in the picture. Like they would love for me to come by or whatever. And so, um, and when they heard that Minnesota didn't, um, did Minnesota didn't want to take me. What ended up happening was that then my coach, my junior college coach, ringed up Fred Hoiberg, and he said, "Oh, you know, his dang situation A, B, and C." And uh, we just uh, we're just curious to know if you still have the uh, you know if you still have an offer on the table, um, if you uh, if you still consider taking down your team and stuff like that. So uh, after that, I think Coach Hoiberg, no, it was one of the coaches, one of the assistant coaches came down, saw me play, whatever, and he was okay. And I guess he, I guess he was partly impressed, whatever the case is. And he said, uh, yeah, we, you know, we'll, we'll offer you a full full ride scholarship and stuff. So. Yeah, and it went from there, and it's it just kind of like, bang, you know what I mean? Just, just happy to have it. I got a full ride to Iowa State, and two years there, um, 
kind of is. It is what it is. Can't complain. You know, it was a part of school history. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I also doing a, di- a bit of digging, you uh, you actually played in Iowa State with uh, current NBA star Monte Morris. Um, did did he seem at the time that he had you know he was destined for greatness and and heading into the in, in you know in that direction towards towards the NBA? Of course he did. Man. He always he always he always came in and worked. He always came in and did whatever he needed to do. Um, he he always knew the game. He always like knew like he read the game really well for a point guard. Like his IQ was like on point, especially given the fact that he had. I think he led three out of four years um, in assist to turnover ratio. You know what I mean? So that's kind of, that's really big. That's really big. In fact, he was leading assist to, ter- he was like top three point guards in assist to turnover ra- uh, ratio in his freshman year. You know, like, it, yeah, he was like, it was like, it was real cool, uh, real good. So, and then these guys like him, uh, Naz Long, George Niang, um, Abdul Nader, you know, the and all those guys, like, they'll come in all doing their work, doing whatever they can in order to be, like, you know, in order to be key roles for the team and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, and that was that was really – it was really interesting to play around those guys because I learned a lot. I learned a lot in terms of, like, knowing how to play the game like this. So, yeah. Yeah, I, and then you you finish your, your stint in Iowa State and evolve into the basketball play. You kind of are today, and – uh, you make the decision to uh, come back to come back to England. What was the what was the decision process coming? Uh, you know, did did you receive the offer from from the Flyers at the beginning, or did, was that a conscious decision that you made? So, excuse me. So when I came to Bristol, um, the main three things that played into it is because I have my siblings here, and I never met my sibling, my sister before I came to Bristol. Um, I had my brother, my mom. And also, too, like, I had, a, I had an opportunity between going to play in Greece, which my agent was trying to get me to play, or either come play in England and just really reconnect yourself with being at home sort of thing. And so, yeah, I've been here reconnecting myself, reconnecting, giving myself, giving myself stability, and then also, too, trying to also build what I want to do towards the future. Yeah, absolutely. Would you consider, you know, reconnecting with family and, and sort of going through that as, as sort of like the highlight of your time at the moment in in England as well? Yeah, I definitely would say like connecting. I want to say connecting my mom and my siblings is more of like the highlight of everything. I'm coming back to England. Also, too, like connecting with, um, you know, the, the Flyers fan base here. You know, they're amazing family and they're amazing uh, group of people who are... I want, well, but I want to say all of them are, you know, they, they love the club, they love, they love the uh, environment, they make the environment feel genuine, sincere and caring. Um, and then, yeah, it's just really, it's really like a lot of hoopsters coming by. And you just, I don't know, it's just, it's just hard because it's like, you, you make it really, really, like, you connect fairly well and you just kind of like, damn, like, it makes it actually kind of hard to leave. But at the end of the day, though, um, you know, Bristol's Bristol. I, I do love Bristol. I do love playing for Bristol, and I do love like being here. It's like another home to me. Definitely, and and with coming back to to England, you also took part in the 2018 Commonwealth Games as well. Uh, you play alongside the you know the likes of Kofi Josephs and uh, and Mike Tuck as well, uh, among other big names across across British basketball. What was that experience like for you to play and represent your country? Man, it's like a it's like a cherry on top of the ice cream, you know. It's like uh, from from childhood to high school to college, college to professional to then being given the opportunity to represent England um, in the Commonwealth Games of twenty eighteen. It's just like it's a dream come true. No, I was gonna say it's a dream come true. It's more like a it's like a it's like it's like a it's like destiny, isn't it? Like everything worked out in your favor in a way that you wouldn't have even have thought thought it to even be or thought of it to even come to, if that makes sense. So it's kind of like, you know, like represent, given, being given a chance, being given an opportunity um, to represent England, you're like, you know you're worthy. You're worthy of whatever opportunity you decide to create in your mind that you decide to go after because you know exactly how, you know, you know exactly what, well, how much you mean. You know what I mean? It's just it's just one of those things. Like, 
to see that from, from, from like, and for me, like going from that part, going from the childhood to adversity to everything else, it's just like, hey, like, okay, like really consider like representing the country. Like never, there wasn't given an opportunity, never was even considered for basketball, never was even considered to, to, to even play GB or nothing like that. And funny enough, because some of the guys that I was playing with on the team, um, they never represented uh, – well, some of them played GB, some of them didn't, you know, never played uh, national basketball. So it was kind of like seeing seeing, hear, seeing people here uh, and hearing people who have had particular experiences or like, who have been given particular opportunities and those who haven't, but those who haven't are actually hungry for it. It's like, okay, it makes that it, – it makes it makes that – the opportunity much more rewarding and much more sweeter. Definitely. And uh, you, you did make it out of Paul B along with uh, Scotland, uh, you know, in that. And you went on to face Canada. And unfortunately, coming out on the short end of, of that. So what what was the feelings in the dressing room after after the loss to, to Team Canada? I'm happy. I was upset. I was angry. I was fuming. I was confused. I was... I was in so many different places. I was feeling, I was experiencing a, a set of mixed emotions and I was just like, you know, I was so grateful for the opportunity and everything, but I'm not grateful for how this has turned out. Like, gone way too soon. You know what I mean? It feels like, um, it feels like we didn't bring our, we didn't bring our fully present competitive side from the jump, it almost felt as though it almost felt as though some guys were there, some guys weren't there. You know, nobody was really united, playing with unity or playing unitedly or playing together. You know, we then we try, then we come out second half ready to actually try and try and actually put up a fight, but then we realized it's too late. So it's kind of like, kind of like you know, like if we had this sort of approach early in the game, then we wouldn't be here. You know what I mean? And, some guys were treating it like a holiday. Like I, I don't know. I was, I was confused because I was trying to understand everybody and trying to understand how I was feeling, how everybody else was feeling. But equally, I wasn't really. I, it's not to say I, I hated, I, I didn't like anybody on the team because it, it wasn't the case. It was just the fact as players and 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 given the fact that this is an opportunity, we was meant to actually come out here and win a medal. Like there was no excuse. Win, find a way to do it. And it's kind of like we kind of threw that down the drain. So it kind of gives another reason as to why basketball shouldn't be, for men, shouldn't be invested into sort of things. So, but I'm not going to let that fall, though, man. I am definitely am still investing into my sport and still trying to invest and create ways to um, help keep the game growing and evolving. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of sucks because it's like, how do you expect a, a team to win the middle if they haven't really received much investment? You know, that's something you really have to consider. So, if you invest into it a little bit more and find ways to help it work or make it work, then maybe we will see a medal so one way or the other, whether that's come off games or something else. Who knows? Uh, yeah, exactly. Who knows? And uh, talking about medals, you were on the brink of uh, the this, this season after you did play uh, in the Commonwealth Games, you went to the, the 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 finals of the BBL Cup. What were the feelings within the Bristol Flyers squad and and you know the coach and staff and everything? What what were the feelings going into into that into such a big game like that? Yeah, it was big, man. It was big. It was one of them ones where you know we of course we're playing on the spotlight and playing on stage and stuff like that. But we're also playing we're also playing for something here. You know, we're playing for. Um, we're playing for our first ever title. I think Worcester was playing for their first ever title as well. So it's kind of like, like, damn, like we got to go in here. We actually have to try to like do whatever we can. But then again, I think some of us were a bit. Well, I think I think most of us tr- was calm. I, th- I firmly firm believe most of us was calm. But then who knows? Some guys may have been a bit nervous or may have been a bit. Um, over aroused or anxious, whatever the case is. So, I don't. Some people want to say we choke, but I, I don't know. I don't know. Some games we don't choke. Some games we do. You know, who knows? Like it's, it's such a it's such a weird one because Worcester, we haven't beaten Worcester all season, you know? <laughs> and now now we're trying to beat them, and we got to beat them at the worst possible time. You know what I mean? So, um, 
And so, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I thought – I personally thought that going into the game, um, I think most of us will come. But then I can't speak for everybody else because I don't know what everybody else is feeling. But I know as a captain, I was trying to be as calm and trying to be as cool as much as I can be. So, Yeah, exactly. you got to try and you know, rally the troops and, and yeah. do the best you can as the captain. And what what did it feel like when, when the final buzzer sounded and you know it, you, you did come up short against, against the Worcester Wolves? It just sucked because it was Worcester again. Like, it just getting in the way, you know. And I, I was just like... Uh, what's the man? I said the worst possible time. I don't even remember who they played prior to that. I think they played uh, Sheffield or something like that. Was it Sheffield? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I might have been at the at the, at the arena that day to uh, to watch them them win. And I I, I do. Uh... I, I was uh, actually in the build-up to to the Worcester Wolves going to there. I was helping on their media team uh, mm. alongside, and, and and they all seem pretty confident uh, going in. And the, the the momentum was kind of in their favour as well. But uh, you guys were obviously you, you were I think you were slightly behind on point uh, on points in the league. So it was really any it could have been anyone's game going in, and uh, the result kind of it was it was a bit. Um, I mean, it, it was disappointing for for you and and the rest of your team as well. Yeah, it, it was it was it was a bit like okay, fine, you know, like we we've lost, but then kind of gives us something to aim for now. Now we can focus on the regular season. And hopefully, we can play. Um, we can play to the best of our abilities, so that way we can, you know, uh, finish in the best possible position, so that or best seed, so that way when we get to the playoffs, I want to say we have an easier route, but we have a much more okay. We're in a good position. Let's be confident in ourselves and where we're at, and let's um, let's aim to bring our best game every in each and every game. Definitely, and uh, I mean with the with the BBL actually now restarting in the August uh, or not in the August in the autumn. Sorry, um, I think they might be going and and starting a new season rather than than finishing uh, this current one. So um, this season been made I think none of, null and void. Um, what are your preparations going into into next season and trying to ch- just work out w- what happens with 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 your game next year? What am I? What sorry? What are your uh, preparations going into into next season? Preparations, uh, more mental toughness, Men- mental toughness, and just trying to um, you know know that it's going to be a physical grind. It is actually going to be a physical grind. Why? Because you know, our season ended in March. And yes, we have been doing some sort of like, you know, training outside or doing some weights, but it's not the same as like actually playing or actually in practice, running around, running up and down sort of thing. And I can imagine we probably, it probably will um, get better and stuff like that, you know, as time goes. But, you know, then you got to think about recovery. You also have to think like, Recovery is going to be a mug because you know if we play if we play two games a week, we're st- and we're still trying to recover from preseason. I mean that's that's a perfect opportunity for an injury. You know what I mean? So it's like taking care of yourself in that sort of sense, and then getting in the game shape and getting into like actual playing. Like you know, it's going to require some actual uh, mental toughness and also uh, being able to overcome fatigue quick, quickly. So. But then again, you know, like I say, it's gonna it'll get better with time. So, it's I mean, patience. the team's got to stay hungry and and definitely improve on you know what what they have done this season because they have done you know a really good job in in, in continuing the momentum from you know the cup final. Maybe maybe next year the Bristol Flyers are going to be winning the cup final or even you know, first of the division. So, uh, hopefully we can we can see you uh, lifting some silverware next year. Hopefully, man, man, that's my goal. We got to got to no excuse. Always the goal. You no can't excuse. really have that. You can't really have space for you know, not not thinking you, you're the best at best at what you do. So, mm. um, coming to come to sort of the end of the interview now. Um, I, I have quite of a you know a, a little bit of a maybe maybe a, a question that does require a bit of uh, a thought and, and a bit of process of elimination. So, uh, who who are the people or person that's kind of helped you through life the most? Um, I mean, that could be yourself because. You, you did spend a proportion of of your life, you know, so, you know, with your own survival instincts. But uh, who who could be, you know, that person that has helped you through life? Helped me through life a little bit. Um, 
cool. It's like two, two or three people. Um, one is my old professor or my old instructor from old instruct instructor from uni. Um, his name's uh, well, yeah, his name's Doctor Webster. Love the guy. Funny guy. Every time you talk to him, he's always happy to hear from you. That's it. You know what I mean? It's always it's always good to have that one person that's like happy to hear from you, talk to you, listen to you, give you some wise advice. It's like a wise man. You know what I mean? Um, so he's like, uh, and he knows. His, you know, the interesting thing with him is he he also knows like he's lived through some times as well in terms of like nineteen forties, fifties. And you know where he's at now. He's he's like sharing stories and like some wise stories. He's like, okay, that makes sense and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, he, he's one of them. And another one I want to say is uh, anything. Another one is well, my recently my mentor. Um, he's actually all right. He's uh, he's uh, he's helped me like through like the life in terms of like business and stuff like that, and um, yeah, he's he's also gave me ways to think about everything that's going on. Um, well, last time I spoke to him a while back, but he's always like helped me. To, he's always giving me like different insights to everything in terms of what I'm looking for, what I want to do, where I want to go moving forward in life and stuff like that, and so. Uh, so yeah, I think those two those two people um, are definitely up there in terms of like who's done what and who's like added value. I mean, I mean it's not to say like there's not many other people who are also um, in that same sort of discussion or in that same sort of category. But if there's two that stand out, it definitely be those two. Well, coming in, coming to the I, I think the last topic of uh, the the interview, and uh, you have done some amazing work recently. Uh, working with the UK uh, Youth Homelessness Charity uh, and you've been running uh, quite a bit recently uh, around around Bristol so talk to me a bit a little bit about you know the work that you've been doing recently with with, with that charity and, and what what your aim is for it so um, it, it actually sorry not trying to correct you here but it was actually an idea that my missus my girlfriend I came up with no it's okay it's okay um and so we what we did was we just we we came up with the whole 4424 thing and we just we just wanted to raise some money in order to help uh homelessness well uk youth homelessness here or youth that are homeless here in the uk and um yeah just kind of went along with that and and just you know shared a, like i told you a little bit of my story and and uh alice's uh alice's like idea and putting it in there i mean she came up with the idea you know i'm not gonna i'm not gonna take all the credit for it um so it was it was it was like okay you know we do this run four miles every four hours for a whole 24 hours and um you know it was, it was a physical gruesome sort of experience but by the end of it some mental toughness came with that which that's cool which i love that actually i actually love that <laughs> and so uh <laughs> And so, uh, with, with homeless with homelessness here in the UK and with the youth, like you'd be surprised at how many different stories, situations, circumstances that the that the youth in the UK are going through in terms of like at home life, you know, and and in terms of like support and in terms of like situations. Um, there's this uh, there's this what should we call it? There's this uh, organization that I do some work with from time to time called, called Consortium for Street Children. And uh, we're talking about street children here. We're talking about some kids because they don't want to go to school during it. Well, because they don't have, they don't have inf the necessary information that is needed for them to be in the school in a day or during the day, like an address, you know, birth certificate or parents' names or et cetera. Uh, they don't get permitted in the school. And if they get caught being around, um, being around uh, the community or being around society or anywhere in the environment when they should be in school, then they could get punished for that. They could get you know, get arrested or whatever the case is. So what they'll do is in order to avoid those consequences, they'll just go in the hiding during the day. And, um, and yeah, and then they come out at night. Quite interesting. So, you know, you just think of stories like that and you think of things like that and you just kind of think, okay, well, let's try and like, 
I mean, just, just try to do something, you know what I mean? Because I'm sure there's, there's youth shelters that are struggling, especially with COVID and what is exposed every and <laughs> like everything, you know, with COVID exposing everything um, in that regard. And it's like, you know, it's, it's, it, does, it's, it doesn't hurt to try and help and try to raise money and try to raise awareness about it as well. I mean, you have raised, you and your, your partner have raised an astounding, I think it's about, uh, last time I checked, it was about £1,200. I'm not sure if it uh, has shot up since then, but uh, it's it's an astounding fee either way. It, it's an amazing work. And I can't uh, commend you and your partner uh, enough for the amount of work that you have done with the with the uh, youth homelessness uh, program here in the, uh, here in the UK. So uh, I think everyone watching this video, can uh, can definitely uh, show their appreciation. Uh, I will leave the link down to the fundraiser uh, in the description as well, so that more people can make donations and more people can can support you uh, on, on the journey that you've just been on. So, all right, sounds sounds good, sounds great, man. It should be, I think it should be, it should be. Well, my missus put in a request for it to be down because we have way more than enough. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's kind of like, but then again. Um, they said that well she was saying that the it's gonna stay up for like twenty eight days or something like that, even with the request. So so it stays live for twenty eight days and then it is it's taken down. So I guess during that time, I mean, if anybody feels free to make a donation. Anybody watching this video, please go ham and, and support uh, <laughs> Daniel and his partners uh, running uh, adventures. Uh, I, I saw the video that you put on your uh, your social media, uh, the the whole journey of you you running and, and, and the, in the in the UK heater because we had a heat wave recently. So yeah, uh, right. hopefully you're all rested up from that and uh, you know, you're kind of having to recover. So uh, thank you so much for joining me. It's it's been an absolute pleasure. Pleasure to, to talk to you, and uh, it, hopefully the future can can bring some bright things for you. Oh, thank you so much, Reese, and you keep up with the great work and with what you're doing here. It's going to turn out very well for you. So, thank you. Stay much. positive with it and have faith. Thank you very much, ladies no and gentlemen, worries. the one and only Daniel Adozi.